Morning, everyone. Good morning, Brian. How's my volume? Oh, it's great. Thank you. All good. Morning, everyone. Hey, Morning. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> you know, I thought about changing that, and then I thought, why bother? <laughs> Hey, Brian, has it been pretty crazy for your department with all the down limbs? My goodness, yeah. I, I think the the queue at one point was over 500 emergency wow. responses. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Larry, our operations manager, yesterday, and he said um, he said they won't be in, a, in, a, in an actual park for weeks because street clearance is going to take full time for at least, at, at least that long it's 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 wild it's 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 basically the worst he's he's ever seen yeah i would agree yeah yeah i'm sure david i'm sure you're seeing exactly what's i'm here to take a break yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i know that i know that ben was actually running, running on monday i think because larry just needed to take a day. He had been going just 20, 24-7 straight. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, the urban forestry in Seattle used to always talk about the second storm. So the first storm is the weather, and the second mm -hmm. storm is when everybody decides that trees are dangerous and starts, you know, wanting to cut them all down. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm worried about that, too. Yeah. Barbara, did you have much ice damage where you live? No, we had, uh, I had over a foot of snow. I, we, so we got heavy snow, but uh, almost no ice. I, I had a little skiff, so it snowed through Sunday. And I know that at least in Southeast Portland and a couple areas down there that uh, it had stopped snowing by that time and was already getting icy. Um, and then we had a little bit of a, like a skiff of ice on the top of the snow by Monday. And I still have probably six inches of snow here. 
but but uh, yeah almost no ice um we had it was a little bit icy one night but uh almost no ice been basically all over the metro area and uh the hardest hit is like westland lake oswego i haven't been into too much on the on the west side like beaverton hillsboro but oregon city's nuked uh wilsonville's nuked um West Lynn is a mess. 43 was closed off and on for days. And I, I don't even know if it's all the way open. I've got clients on, in the hills up there. They're just like, I, we can't even get to their place to, to chip up stuff. So. Well, I, I heard on NPR this morning that at one time, everybody in Oregon City was without power. So there must have been some serious tree Oh yeah, it was like it was like uh, fireworks going off watching the transformers blow. I was worried the PG was going to run out of transformers. <clears throat> Excuse me, I was worried the PG was going to run out of transformers. Wow, it was just yeah, it's 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 ridiculous. That's, un that's unbelievable. Yep, yep. We were out for like I don't know till like Tuesday, out of power. So. Yeah, Megan's out of power, and I'm not sure about Anjanette, but I think she might be out of power too. Anjanette's here. Anjanette's here. Anjanette. <laughs> oh my God, Anjanette made it. Thank you all for making it. Yeah, thank you all. Yep. Just when you thought 2020 was over, <laughs> it lingers on. 2021. Yep. <laughs> Keeping it rolling. Yeah. Well, great. Looks like we have quorum. Yep. We're ready to get started. I'll hit my butterfly gavel here. Ding, 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 ding. Um, let's go ahead and get started. We have some really interesting discussions coming up today. I want to start um, with just acknowledging all the um, challenges you've probably all been through this last week and the fact that you may, many of you may have lost power, many of you may be dealing with lots of additional things on top of a pandemic, on top of everything else that's been going on. So really grateful for your uh, time and your willingness to show up today. This is this kind of stuff that keeps uh, the city running and keeps us all um, involved in these discussions and um, keeping us, uh, yeah, on top of the decisions that need to be made with community input. So yeah, really grateful for your time. Um, Want to get started with public comments, speaking of input, and I think we have one public comment. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, I know that um, Doug would like to provide a comment. And um, if anyone else who's attending can use the raise your hand feature, um, we'll get to you as well. Looks like I see one other one. So let me get Doug in here first. Oh. Um, I have two. Hi, I have two different hi. things to comment on. Uh, one is uh, for you folks, and another one's for Matt Burko, but I guess he's not here, so I, I don't know how how one com makes comments to Matt. But, he will be. We can echo right. them too, Doug. All right. Okay. Uh, two things. One, I sent uh, some of you a picture and Jan a picture of uh, Southeast 82nd from Stark to Washington. There's a new building on the east side of the 82nd there. 200 foot of frontage, a whole block zero trees and I am wondering if that is ODOT not wanting trees or it, it, there's, there is a street light in the middle of the 200 feet but that still doesn't seem and there's trees on the other two frontages on Stark and on Washington so I don't know what's going on there just thought I'd flag that um, second thing is for Matt Burko um, there's I, I'm concerned that uh, uh, Peabot's approach is uh, um, to take advantage of whatever's there at the time and not plan for the future in setting things in the right of way. Uh, some signal poles went in at 34th and Division uh, toward the back of the sidewalk, um, right where a building can be built right up against the sidewalk and it's encouraged to. And then that building may have awnings that, that stick out four feet and balconies that stick out four feet. So they're putting poles in place where they'll preclude the sort of pedestrian amenities that the city is trying to get. Um, so uh, the one at 34th is going to be out, out three feet, so it won't intrude a lot. But I see that I see that often. It's just put put things at the back of the walk 
because there's not a building there now, there's a gas station there now, you know, ignoring the fact that either the current zoning or zoning upcoming could put a building right there. And then the, the pole will be blocking where there should be a nice corner entrance. So that's what I would like to pass on to Matt Burko. And then, and of course, my concern about what's going on in 82nd. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Was that, did you say 34th and Southeast Division? Yes, on the um, southwest corner. And there's also one right at the back of walk on the south, on the northeast corner, which right now is zoned RM2, which has a, 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 a minimum five foot setback, but that zoning could change. And uh, some, some people may be wanting it to change. So that's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's possible. I, 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 I know the reason that this was done because there's existing poles and they're trying to work around them. Um, but it could be done, it would mean one more pole rather than have a mast arm set back so it can spring out be behind another pole and reach out to an adjacent street. They should have just put another, designed another pole. And I, I, you know, I, I have sent a note to um, Peter Kuntz as well, but I haven't gotten heard back from him about that, so. Okay. Any questions, commissioners, for Doug? Clarifications? Okay. okay. Actually, I was, I was looking at uh, Google Maps on there. Doug, where, what corner is this? I, I don't see a gas station. No, yes. um, I, no, no, it's a parking lot. I would say just this, this, the oh, situation where you, where you don't have a building there. But no, the, the, the pole has newly been placed on the, uh, the southwest corner in front of that um, Olympia, Olympia Provisions, uh, you know, our parking lot uh, with a they hadn't there's a food food service in it right now, but sure. that you know, that that lot will will allow a five story building right up against the property line, and well except that they're going to need a, a two foot three foot dedication so it will be three foot back from the property line but they put that pole right at the property line, and so it, right over now, right now the pole's at the at, at the very corner of the of the street. Well, they didn't know actually. It's about. Uh, Eight feet uh, west, um, oh, and they're, they're doing, uh, June twenty nineteen, uh, Google Street View. It's at the very corner of the street. It used used to be probably, right? Yeah, I and mean, this is we've done in the last week. Yeah, so it wouldn't be up on Google Street View. And the other one was put on the northeast corner, in front of that house, right at the back of the sidewalk at the property corner. Mm. And that that's zoned for multifamily zoning. Sorry. Right. Uh, Bruce, quick clarification. Um, yeah, this is I'm hoping Jen has information on this. Um, I think 82nd is a state road. Um, yes. Yeah. So yeah. does, does that mean uh, urban forestry has no jurisdiction, jurisdiction there regarding trees? Good, good question, Bruce. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah. My internet's been e all morning. Um, yes, yeah, so technically, uh, the tree, city's tree regulations, Title 11, do not apply on state-owned property, including state-owned rights of way. However, there's a lot of technically state-owned roads in Portland. <clears throat> and um, in general, the Department of Transportation, ODOT, tries to voluntarily um, address the tree code requirements. Uh, the bottom line is they don't have to. So we work with them as does PBOT for things tree and otherwise to, to try to get what our goals are out of Aero Street. Those not always work. And in some cases, ODOT doesn't own the sidewalk. In some cases they do. That's right. Yeah, right. That's right. Yep. It, it, depend, it depends on the street, what parts of a state right of way are actually owned by the state and which are owned by the city. It's an amazingly complicated map if you ever wanted to see it. Just to keep things interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's, thanks, Doug. Your eyes on the street are always an inspiration to us and I'm watching uh, the neighborhood more closely because of you. Thank you. Um, we do have one more public comment. One more? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. 
Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yashar Vasaf. I'm the new uh, executive director at Friends of Trees, and I just wanted to take a quick minute to say hello and introduce myself. Um, uh, I use he, him pronouns. I do not come from a background of tree expertise. I, I have more of a work history around mobilizing the community, and, and I previously used to work for the United Nations Foundation, advocating for issues like climate change, also refugee aid, uh, and, and things along that front. I'm a former refugee myself, so what drew me to Friends of Trees uh, really is not just the, the local impact, which is super important, but also, you know, this is part of global climate action and I feel the urgency of now. And I'm just looking forward to better understanding the function of, of this body and, and um, seeing where Friends of Trees may fit into your vision. And yeah, so just want to drop by, say hello. And um, I know you're probably very busy after the recent storm, but uh, ideally I'd love to get to know uh, y'all one-on-one uh, -on -one if, if the opportunity presents itself. So. Yeah, just wanted to say hello, and um, I'll sit back and listen. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Yashar. Really appreciate you coming in. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations on the new post. Thank you. Uh, great. And I'd um, like to move on to minutes. If you've had a chance to review the minutes for, that Brian sent out, um, we have minutes from um, January 2021, just last month. I think we're all caught up if we have these minutes uh, reviewed and approved. And I'm asking for any edits, any revisions. I have one I'd like to comment on. And other than that, All right, um, Brian, um, I'm wondering if it's possible. Um, this, is, this was something new that we did last month, but just a, just a check in through the menti.com site. I'm wondering if we could include any way to include that. That's a very visual um, component. So I'm just wondering, is that how to actually bring that up? Because it did address these, it did address these two issues of you know, what was a notable notable achievement in 2021 and what was an important UFC item for, uh, what was a notable item for 2020 and what's an important item for 2021. And I'm wondering if any of that can be represented in the meetings and how we might go about doing that. Yeah, I think if you can send me, um, if you if you're ever to send me a screenshot of the like word cloud, I, I, I think it might just drop that in um, okay. at the end, yeah. Okay just as a way of keeping the record of things that we keep coming back to. And some of those are acronyms like, you know, we had, we had things like UFMP, uh, right? And T11, and they could sound like, yeah, they could sound like anything, but we, we uh, to the extent that we can spell any of those out, that would be great too. Sure thing. At least the obvious ones. I think there are, I think all of them are pretty obvious for us. Mm -hmm. Any other minutes? Anything else? Uh, you're muted, Bruce, if you're talking. I would move that we accept the minutes as uh, Brian's latest edit and also that uh, suggestion that you made for a change to the last part of the minutes. And I, I would second that. Okay, we have motion. Um, all in favor, you can, um, I don't know, you can raise your virtual hand or your actual hand, <laughs> one or, and or both. You won't get counted twice if you raise both. <laughs> all right, uh, all opposed? Um, any abstentions? Amen, noted. All right, so moved. Thanks, thanks for getting us all up to date here. Um, moving on, to, uh, moving on now to Forster's report. I think I, do I have that right? 
Yes. My screen just did a funny thing here. There we go. Okay, yeah, Jen, Forster's report. Great, thank you, Vivek. Good morning, everybody. It's really good to see you all. And thank you for being here, especially given the challenging circumstances we all were talking about before. Um, and as always, I and many others appreciate your volunteer service to the city, people, and trees, especially when it's really hard to focus on these things with everything going on. So before I get into my report, uh, I wanted to introduce some meeting observers who are with us today. Um, she may not be here yet, but I believe Cynthia Castro is planning to join just to listen in and watch. Cynthia is a senior policy advisor with Commissioner Rubio's office. And also I see Matt Glazuski. is that correct, Matt? Did I say that right? All right, Matt Glazuski is here. He's a senior policy advisor for Commissioner Maps as well. So welcome, Cynthia and Matt. And I think Matt's been going to various um, advisory board meetings just to get familiar and listen in. Um, so we're happy to see you here today, Matt. And then Anjanette, wave me off if you don't want to do this, but I wondered if we could meet what looks like a new little person with you. And your, your audio might be off. Hello. Hey. <laughs> okay, this is a Noah Rain. And she is eight weeks old. Hello, Anora. Was it Anora Rain? How did you? Anora. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the meeting. <laughs> Thank you for making it, Anjanette. Clearly, you literally have your hands. Probably our youngest attendee yet. Yeah. <laughs> she can be an ex officio member. Okay, then uh, I'll move into my report. I have five items for today. Um, first, although this is operations related rather than policy, I'm sure you're interested in hearing about the storm response. And of course, that's a big part of what we've been doing and will be doing for a while in urban forestry. So um, I heard y'all talking about this at the beginning of the meeting. Um, we too in Portland have had really unprecedented tree damage citywide, and that's according to our most senior urban forestry team members, some of whom have been around for a good 20 plus years. Um, they've seen a lot. So over the weekend, we had 60 call outs, then on Monday alone, another 300. And as of this morning, we have over 600. So as a reminder, urban forestry provides 24 seven tree emergency response for all public roads and city owned and managed properties in the city. So in effect, we run an emergency response service for trees, similar to firefighters, police, wastewater maintenance, drinking water supply, traffic management, and similar types of needed functions for residents. Um, it's inherently dangerous and specialized work. So I wanna take this opportunity to give a huge, huge thank you and appreciation to our operations team and our tree technicians, who are also our customer service and dispatch folks. They've been working very long hours um, since really Saturday, Friday evening. I'm happy to report we've had no team injuries and we have addressed or are addressing right now the most significant issues. Those have included full road blockages of uh, West Burnside, Barber Boulevard, Southwest Capitol Highway. We had a tree on a building at the South Park blocks. Uh, one of those great big elms, uh, streetcar line obstructions, and we also had a tree threatening to fall down into I-405 downtown. So completing clearing roadways will take some time and debris cleanup, which is a little bit separate from opening roads and removing active hazards, will take several weeks. And we're coordinating closely with the Bureau of Transportation maintenance operations as we always do on this. Uh, urban Forestry and, and PBOT Maintenance have a very strong partnership, and so I want to thank them as well uh, for their coordination and work with us, which will continue for the next several weeks. And also to the Oregon Department of Transportation, ODOT, um, we needed to call on them for some road closure assistance over the weekend for interstates because of tree threats there. So um, many failures that we're seeing uh, could have been anticipated 
or I'm sorry, could not have been anticipated. However, many of the failures we're seeing, branches and full trees that are down, could have been expected. So from an arboricultural and urban forest management perspective, the event is a, an illustration of how important expertise and care for the full life cycle of the tree is. So from planting in regards to where we plant, what species are selected, what the quality of the stock, the tree stock itself, the tree is that's planted, the technique that's used for planting to how the young tree is pruned so it has safe structure, especially if it's on the street or in a park near high youth areas, to mature tree maintenance and proactively identifying and addressing potential hazards and preserving tree longevity. So we've lost a lot of trees in this storm. And as we get through all the damage in parks, uh, we're probably gonna find that we're, we're, we're gonna need to take out more than we're even anticipating, which makes me very sad um, and is really unfortunate, especially as we're in a climate crisis that's getting worse and we already have really marked inequities in our tree distribution. So we really need to be going in the other direction when something like this happens. Um, so to move off from an, an unhappy note, I'll move to something a little brighter and more hopeful. And that is my second item. Uh, some very good news. The Portland Parks and Recreation Interfund Loan and Supplemental Budget were unanimously and enthusiastically approved by city commissioners yesterday. So this is all part of that operations levy that you've been hearing about to help advance some of our priorities and do more tree care, including proactive park tree maintenance, which I just mentioned. Um, so we're really happy about that. I'm thrilled, our team is thrilled, the Bureau is thrilled. And this allows us to begin what we call ramping up for the operations levy. So um, we're going to be able to get some new resources and positions on board very soon, like between now and November, that'll build the foundation for implementing the rest of the commitments that we made to voters with the operations levy. And remember that the operations levy is but one part of the larger sustainable future project, which you've heard about a few times now and Vivek has participated directly in with us. Um, and that project is to secure reliable ongoing funding for Portland Parks and Rec services, including urban forestry's role, managing, improving and expanding, resolving the inequity in forest services to all Portlanders. That's great news. I'm going to pause for a minute. Appreciate it. That's fantastic news. Coupled with really bad news about the storm. I'm going to focus on the good news. Do I have any questions on those things before I move to my last three shorter items? Um, I do. Can I, I, I just like uh, Jen to, uh, I'd like to do a round robin at some point. So I don't know if we want to do a clarification now or if we can uh, hold questions until the end and do a round robin on on everything that would be I think probably our time wise might be most efficient. Great that sounds good to me Vivek so we'll hold off on questions take your notes. Yeah main and, notes please. And Jen um, I just want to note uh, Cynthia just just joined um, since we introduced uh, her earlier and Matt Matt would actually like to um, in introduce himself to a little more fully to the to, to the commission. Great. Uh, we will, Matt, do you want to go ahead and do that now? And then since I'm between items. Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Klazuski here from Commissioner Mapp's office, as was introduced. Uh, I'm the Bureau Liaison for the Water Bureau and for Environmental Services. And uh, we love trees, too. <laughs> uh, Environmental Services, of course, has its own uh, amazing program where they've been uh, partnering with our friends of, uh, friends of trees for um, the better part of a decade plus on uh, planting street trees for stormwater management purposes. So excited to be here. Um, I, I like to go out and hug trees all the time. I've actually got three growing in my yard that I uh, had, I think a, a squirrel pooped out a, a, a seed or something like that, but I've got a dug fir, I've got a silver fir, and I've got a red cedar that are all growing in random places in my yard. So I've replanted them in places where they can get a nice full bit of sun and growth. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, and just meet everyone. It's, I, I recognize a few folks here already that I've known from other roles, which is great. Um, it's nice to see. It's nice to see you, Daniel and Vivek, of course. Um, and you know, this 
This summer, I mean, I understand that there was some really great facilitation and leadership done, uh, work done by uh, Professor Sean this year and his colleague, Professor Allen from Portland State. And one of the things is that uh, I understand we heard from the community is that city boroughs need to work better together um, in more organized and reliable coordination and collaboration efforts for more seamless service delivery. Uh, and the mayor has directed uh, Commissioner Maps to, to work on strengthening these relationships uh, with parks uh, and PBOT and a number of other uh, bureaus as well that are not in our immediate portfolio. So Cynthia and I have already been chatting about a number of uh, ways that we can work together, which has been, been really uh, terrific. Um, and you know, the fact that we need to center our tree work around community needs um, and be prepared you know, to co-create that, that shared vision for a Portland herbistry, uh, urban forestry. Um, and, you know, I'm here to assure the Urban Forestry Commission um, that, uh, you know, you've, um, you've made the ask, I've, I've heard it, and um, I'm committed to making sure that we can deliver on it uh, from my perspective. And uh, I'm excited to work with you. So if you ever would like to chat about it, any of it, um, please, I'm at your disposal. Send a message to me anytime. I'll put my email in the chat. So thank you. Great, thank, thank you, thank you, Matt. And um, I'm sorry, I'd understood you didn't want to make any comments, so I'm glad you spoke up and, and took the opportunity. And um, folks, you'll recall that the street tree planting program that Matt's talking about, that EES has, um, the Environmental Services Tree Program, is something that we're partnered closely on in parks with EES. It, it occurs under our programmatic permits and under the specifications and expertise of our team. Um, so we're doing that work all the time year round. Um, and I don't know, Cynthia, did you want to say anything as well since Matt took the opportunity? Sure, I'll just be quick. Um, hi, everybody. Cynthia Castro. I'm a senior policy advisor for Commissioner Rubio. Um, before this appointment, I was a senior policy advisor for Commissioner Fritz. And before that, I had the fortune of working for Portland Parks and Recreation for almost five years, um, first in our director's office and then also in our recreation division. So. I'm um, just happy to be here and to meet all of you and um, to hear about the good work of urban forestry. Thanks, Cynthia. Great, it's good to have you both here. It's rare we have two commissioner's offices at one time, it's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna finish up my points and then we, I'll turn it back to Vivek if he wants to do that round robin, if there's any questions or, or clarifications that are desired. Um, so this is item three of five. Um, I had mentioned it at a previous meeting, but there were questions at the last meeting towards the end. So I wanted to refresh you all about that um, proposed city code amendment that would have required separate water meters in right of way for new construction. And um, we in urban forestry and you all had identified that that would create a significant potential conflict with street tree space, which is already um, in, in little supply. And in fact, instead of making that amendment to the city code, the Portland Water Bureau opted to make it an optional feature to have separate meters. Um, so that basically means things can continue the way they have been with one meter for several units instead of having several in the planting space or otherwise in right away. So I wanted to point that out because I know you folks are always thinking are we making a difference? And here's an example of where the commission made a really important difference. If you recall, you discussed this at a meeting, you wrote some letters around it. And also I think it was Bruce who went to the city council work session and gave testimony to that effect. And we see that um, you were all heard and the results are, are positive for trees. And I know we had discussed also at that time whether water meters might go someplace else altogether. So not anywhere in the planting strip, but maybe in the hardscape where trees can't be or in the driveway aprons or even on private property. And know that the discussions that we've had with the water bureau is that they are looking at those things and may be able to address that sometime in the future. So thank you for that advice to the city. Um, my fourth item is just a re reminder, I've committed to telling you about our progress on the street tree maintenance project. Um, and I wanted to give that update today. We haven't had any progress on that to report on from the last meeting. And again, that's the, the project that we're working on to identify options and costs 
of the city assuming responsibility for street tree maintenance instead of it being the adjacent property owner's responsibility, which we know is a very significant barrier and burden for a lot of residents to even having or wanting a tree, even if we give it to them for free, which is what we're doing right now. <clears throat> and it's interesting, a lot of folks don't want a tree, even if it's free because of that maintenance obligation. My last item uh, is really just introducing Matt, not really, but letting you know that a lot of the meeting today is hopefully you've seen on the agenda will be about the streets 2035 project. And I've been updating you pretty much every month on progress on that project. So today we'll have the opportunity to hear about uh, the project status and uh, some of the specific topics in that status. For example, as we talked about last meeting, including with Doug Klotz, um, the, what we're calling the 10 foot rule that Water Bureau has put in place prohibiting tree planting within 10 feet of a large water line. So that'll be part of the discussion today. Um, and we may have additional forestry staff join us for that for that item, specifically Casey Jogerst, who is our tree regulation and permitting manager, and Rick Faber, who is the regulations coordinator for urban forestry. That completes my report. Vivek, I'll turn it back to you to manage any questions, however you'd like. Great, and we don't have a, we, we're, we're really tight on time today, although we do have that shift of, of I think the appeal is canceled today, Brian, do I have that right? So, we, yes. do have, we do have a little chunk of time that may not show up on the agenda right now. So I'm going to use that time to go uh, round robin and maybe uh, Barbara, Bar Barbara, Barbara, can I start with you? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think, uh, I don't think I have any questions at the moment. Okay, we'll come back if, if you do. Bruce? This is regarding the uh, tree damage from the storm. Uh, I think I've asked this question in the past, but I'll ask it again. Are there any records being kept on um, what trees are failing uh, and why the failure is occurring so that information could be used to uh, convey to citizens what trees are appropriate to plant or to perhaps, anyway, it's, it's supporting evidence for changes that we need. Great question, Bruce, spot on. <clears throat> Not only for residents, right, but that's information we need as the forest managers to know what should we tell folks to plant, require to plant or not, right? Um, so unfortunately, as you've heard me hopefully mention before, we don't have a software system that allows us to do real forest asset management tracking. Like we're trying to get that and that is part of the operations levy uh, request that's prioritized by the Bureau. So some of the ramp up, as I described before, includes bringing folks on board to help get that type of software up and running. What we do have is a permitting system. So we have information per site um, regarding permit activity. And we also have our inventories that are in GIS. What we don't have is a way to like query those or track or do any analysis um, and that is something we absolutely want to have and hopefully will within the next couple of years. Okay, Daniel. Okay, thanks Vivek. Yeah, um, Doug's uh, comment about 82nd Street kind of reminds me of an issue I wanted to make sure we get on our radar and kind of ask a, maybe ask a question of Matt Burko. I know we're gonna, be talking about streets 2035 later, but it does kind of remind me that between now and when streets 2035 eventually gets implemented, which I don't know, a couple of years, I don't know how long it's gonna take. We, we continually have a lot of these issues popping up that are gonna be addressed in 2035. So I'm wondering, is there a mechanism whereby as projects happen before streets 2035 takes effect, that we can make sure that the issues we're raising get addressed in these current projects. Cause it seems like, you know, every time we have a, a new street uh, paved or some of these bigger projects happening, there are these same issues about room for street trees that come up. So I'm just wondering if there's a mechanism to get that particular issue brought, brought up in importance before 2035 gets implemented. So thanks.
Is that a question we might um, might hold? And yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking, since that's on the agenda for later yeah. on. I'm thinking that that's something we could address, but I just wanted to yeah. get it on the agenda part of the uh, questions. Excellent. Yeah, it's a really important point, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Damon. Um, I guess the only thing I've got to say is just, I'm, I'm glad to see both of uh, both commissioner's offices represented here uh, from uh, from a lot of the uh, environmentally inclined uh, bureaus for the city. Um, and uh, I would like to echo Doug Klotz's uh, uh, concerns about how we're planning for streets, how we're planning for um, space for trees in streets uh, going forward because uh, we just lost a lot of them. And we are, you know, probably not seeing as much space allowed for uh, replanting and and afforestation as well. So that's my that's my thoughts. Okay, great. Thanks, Damon. And Jeanette, it looks like we'll skip you. You don't have questions. Um, Greg. You're on mute, Greg. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, sorry. Um, this is minor in the scope of the damage uh, to trees, but the heritage trees are near and dear to my heart. And I'm wondering, um, as the emergency response is underway, is there any note made if like a plaque is noticed, it's like, oops, that was a street tree heritage tree or that's a, a park tree heritage tree. Um, Gina and I have talked about some ways to be more methodical with our sort of volunteer inspections. Um, but there's over 300 trees to look at. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can answer that. Vivek, do you want me to answer okay. that? Yeah, yeah please. Yes, uh, we do note that, Greg, always. So in spite of not having uh, a software system, we are at least up to 1980s speed. Uh, we do have paper that we use for every emergency event. And I will tell you, it's crazy to do it that way. Um, we spend a significant amount of staff time redoing the same data in four different places consequently, and still don't have the analytical capacity that Bruce mentioned, which is essential to managing infrastructure, whether it's built or green. So a bit of frustration there on my part, but um, Greg, indeed, when a heritage tree is damaged, uh, it is documented as such, and there's always follow-up on it. <clears throat> Thanks, Greg. Um, I wanna uh, check in with Lorena. Any questions? Uh, no, no questions for now, thank you. Okay, great, thanks, Lorena. Just um, anything else, just in terms of damage Jen, since we've talked so much about low canopy, low income neighborhoods as being priorities, and I, um, just thinking about communities that often have to rely have to rely on um, leaving the house, I'm trying to figure out how best to uh, ask this, but there are some areas of the city where we know that communities are uh, commuting a lot more and uh, depend on um, being able to get to work and being able to move around for livelihood. So just wondering about like the spatial distribution of tree damage that's occurred and kind of digging into this, maybe not as detailed as Bruce, which uh, Bruce's question in terms of specific trees and the stock, mm -hmm. et cetera, and all the criteria you brought up. I'm just wondering even if we can say anything about the spatial distribution to kind of get an understanding of what kind of implications this might mean for the low canopy, low income neighborhoods, as well as those communities that might have to be dependent on getting to work and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Unlike me who works from home. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. Great question. Vivek. I'm going to try to be more concise for time, but um, in my report, I mentioned some specific issues that we had prioritized addressing. Those are about transportation, right? The first place we go is where there's a dire life risk, life safety risk. Um, and where the biggest roads, the arterials, the emergency access routes to hospitals or where fire routes, fire, fire stations are. So you heard some of those and those are already taken care of because they're first on our list. 
when it comes to tree distribution, you know, we have a, a remarkable, well-documented, we've known for years and have tracked it for years, canopy inequity in the city. So low income and low um, canopy neighborhoods don't have as many trees, literally. So when there's a big storm event, they're less impacted by the storm. A lot of the damage we're seeing right now is West Hills, uh, inner Southeast, East Moreland, for example. Interestingly, like Lads Edition didn't get as much damage as East Moreland. Um, so that answers that question. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to um, ask Casey, I see, I, I see Casey um, has arrived. I'd like to ask Casey to introduce herself, if you would. And Jen gave you a little, little um, summary introduction already. So given the conversation with Matt and team here, um, be great to have your, a little bit about your background too, and why you're here. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry if I wasn't here, my son is taking standardized testing today and it's quite a, uh, it's quite a test of my skills to get them set up to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you. So I'm Casey Joker, the Urban Forest Permitting and Regulation Manager. And um, I oversee essentially four different work groups. Um, so I'll start with um, the tree tech team, which is a term that you may have heard, but otherwise kind of known as the urban forestry intake. Um, the individuals that manage the tree hotline, as well as 823 or the uh, trees at email inbox. Um, and they are a team of five that essentially take everything related to trees that comes in for the city and kind of distributes that, as well as puts all the cases that we get into our permitting database and kind of assigns it out. Um, so they are essentially sort of the, the one-stop shop for all things trees throughout Portland. Um, which is an important point to make because it's not just for urban forestry. So anybody that has any sort of tree concern, that's um, essentially where they're directed to, to contact the city. Um, and then I also have three tree inspector groups. And uh, one of them is the non-development tree inspectors. And those are the ones that essentially do the residential type permitting. You know, when property owners wanna prune a tree, remove a tree, um, but involved in that is also all the code compliance, um, programmatic permits, and a very varying types of permit relationships, um, which is a little bit different in some other bureaus where there would be maybe three different types of people doing the type of work that those tree inspectors are doing, um, such as having sort of a code compliance inspector versus somebody who's doing the actual permits themselves. Um, and then there's two tree inspector groups that are development. Um, one of them is private development. So those are um, the private developers, those that are building single family residence homes, commercial properties. And then there's another tree inspector group that runs all the capital projects. So essentially the city projects funded through um, city dollars. And there's two of them that do the capital projects and there's three of them that do the private developments. Um, and again, they also, similar to the non-development tree inspectors, are managing sort of a full spectrum of intake, the plan review, the permitting, the on-site inspection, and the code compliance. Um, so a pretty, pretty heavy lift for those individuals and pretty broad, broad spectrum of what they do. And I wanted to explain, if I make uh, capital projects in case that's not a familiar term. So anytime the city is undertaking a development project, if it's PBOT, redesigning a right-of-way, it's BES, working on a pumping station or you know, Columbia Wastewater Treatment Plant or, or Water Bureau, whomever, um, are doing a development project, we're involved to represent the tree interests and implement the tree code and provide the tree expertise for that. So that's what Casey's CIP, Capital Improvement Project Team does. Thank you. And I also just wanted to mention that I'm not always here because there is a similar committee that BDS runs, the Bureau of Development Services, that's called the Development Review Advisory Committee. And I sit on that and they happen to be on the same day and overlap at the same time. Um, so just sharing, that's why you don't always see my face here because I'm over there representing urban forestry, making sure that um, we have a voice and a face at the table when we're talking about development because um, as we're gonna talk about it today, it's pretty important that we are there and represented. Great, thanks Casey. Yeah. Appreciate that background. Um, without further ado, Matt, thanks for your patience and Michelle, thanks for your patience. We're um, ready to transition to your, um, 
update for us. Thank you. You've come in a couple of times to remind commissioners you've come in a couple of times and given us these periodic updates. These are really helpful for us to keep track of this. Uh, this uh, I'm not going to call it a monster project, but probably a monster project of sorts. Uh, at least the way you characterized it last time is a really big one and lots of moving parts. So um, with uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to you. And if you would just let us know if there's specific things you're looking for feedback on today or if it's just more general. That'd Sounds be good to be back. And you said you guys are running behind on time. So is there um, how what kind of time frame do you want me to sort of stick to here? We're scheduled to um, 11. OK. Right? Brian, are we scheduled to 11, 11.30? We can go till, um, we have a heritage street item at the very end, so we can go till 11.15. Okay. okay, great. And, and, and Vivek, when, uh, or maybe, you know, I what Daniel was referencing 82nd Avenue and how, I, I wasn't, I don't know if you guys were speaking before I joined at 10. Um, is there a 30 second, one minute update just so that I can um, have that in mind as I'm sort of presenting? Um, it was actually a public comment that was brought up a couple of spots, one on uh, 34th Southeast Division and the other was on 82nd Avenue between, I think it was Stark and Washington. Um, there was some concerns around um, the, the utility poles as well as the um, kind of building frontage and what um, relationship that has to the sidewalks and the extent to which there's actually available space for trees in any of these spots. So it was really a design question that might yeah. Uh, that might fold into some of your updates as well, and okay. we can get to that in due time. That sounds good. And I would also just like to, hello, everybody. Um, I think it's been about a year since I was last here, and I just wanted to also um, acknowledge that Michelle Marks, who is our pedestrian coordinator, uh, is also on the call. Um, there is an element, certainly that a lot of the items that relate to trees um, are happening in the sort of pedestrian zone of the right-of-way, and we are, I think Michelle was here uh, some months back to let you know we're concurrently updating the pedestrian design guide. Um, so these projects are kind of working together. I'm going to kind of lead the presentation and Michelle will jump in uh, as she wants to um, and then certainly for the discussion. So hello Michelle. All right so let me I've got a brief presentation and I'm happy to take questions as we go um, and or at the end. Um, and in terms of Vivek, what you were asking, you know, why we're here, what we're looking for, it is a monster project. I would say that's fairly accurate. Um, the the both the variety of items uh, that take place in the right of way, and just the variety of contexts of which they do take place. Just you, you're constantly sort of tugging on another string, you know, and, and the problems are take a lot of persistence. So I, I'm just kind of here to provide an update, um, you know, remind you, uh, hopefully that I've heard the, the interests and concerns of this group and, and to assure you that we are continuing to work on them. So we don't, you know, we don't have decision points yet for your input, um, but we do anticipate that, you know, the citizen advisory committee structure is a part of important part of the project. So I think, I think this is the third time I'm here. I think I was here before the project started and then provided kind of a phase one update you know, existing conditions phase update last year. So that's kind of the context. Um, I will share my screen. Give me half a second here. All right, and let me know when, if and when you can see my screen. Yep, looks good. Got it. Okay. Now let me just make it so I can still see all of you. All right. So, well, this is today. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to just kind of remind everybody, you know, it is a kind of big and complicated project. So I just want to remind everyone what the what the purpose of the project, what it's aspiring to, and and kind of just let you know where we are, uh, issues wise, um, on on the particularly the tree related issues uh, related to streets 2035 and just kind of an update on, on the time frame of the project. So, you know, the, the why of the project is that um, the, the right of way is does a lot of things. It, it delivers a lot of public services. Our, our comprehensive plan acknowledges that, that the right of way delivers, you know, urban forestry and um, 
public and private utilities underground, various forms of transportation and access to land uses. And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that happens. Um, and, you know, each of these elements, as I'll kind of show on my next slide has, you know, we have code and rules that, that implement these things. We have design standards, we trees, you know, trees desire a certain amount of space for healthy, for healthy trees, adequate soil volume, bicycle infrastructure needs space, water lines need space. And so when we come together in the realities of our, of our, um, you know, whether it's a development site or a capital project, space is often limited in these, uh, these guidelines, you know, uh, these services come together. And so this is, we really need a framework that, that helps to bind these together so we can consistently make decisions to really, um, bring about the the kind of goals that we all aspire to on behalf of the city. And so, um, yeah, so the, these things are just kind of color coded by the fact that there are multiple bureaus, you know, who administer all of these items. So, you know, the city's a big entity and, and we're helping, we're trying to kind of make the right decision in the right place, um, you know, to advance our, our various goals. So again, so at the highest level, that's what we're trying to achieve. The comp plan calls for multimodal transportation, access movement, managing stormwater, delivering water and utilities and tree canopy, active community uses of the right of way. And like I mentioned, you know, all of these items have their own design standards that require space. And when we come to kind of the limited space in the right of way, uh, we get to a situation where it's case by case resolution. And then there's just an acknowledgement that, that we could do better. And so, you know, Streets 2035 is kind of aiming to, to step in right here. Um, just a reminder of the objectives that we set for the project. Um, you know, we're aiming to develop a context sensitive decision making framework. And when I say context sensitive, um, you know, there's, we cannot, there's literally not space for everything everywhere, right? So how do we make the, you know, and we shouldn't necessarily make the same decision on a local street as on a primary 82nd Avenue arterial. Um, so context matters. At the, again, the highest level we're trying to advance uh, these, you know, the various goals that we all have on behalf of the city. We want to reduce the situations when we can't meet everybody's standards and staff are having to kind of negotiate in more of a one off basis. Um, you know, all of that creates uncertainty for people who are wishing to develop land, right? When, if you have an instance where um, PBOT is, you know, trying to implement a sidewalk project, whether through capital or development and, and forestry is, is, um, advocating for the preservation of a tree and if as that's being negotiated that's just causing delay and uncertainty for people who are who are engaging in the development process and then we also want to create a consistent starting point for capital project design and again even as we kind of try to do more on our in our growing city and our sort of our streets and our rights away are, are really staying the same size and so even within our transportation policies how do we reconcile streets that are important for transit and for bikes and for pedestrians and freight and emergency services. You know, we have, we have plenty of those issues to sort out as well. So it is a monster project. Uh, we have a technical advisory group. Um, Jen sits on that group. Casey actually comes to a, a lot of the meetings as well. Um, and so we have all of our, all of the partners who, who's, whose infrastructure has a, is delivered within the right of way is on our advisory group. And and we are coming to all of the uh, citizen advisory committees for periodic updates. Where we are right now, the project is essentially, you can think of it as in three phases. And I think I explained this last time. The first phase was existing conditions, right? Like what are, what are our rights way? How big are they? How does the, how is it differing in, you know, the Southwest uh, versus in East Portland versus, you know, the inner neighborhoods. Um, you know, when, when we're delivering our services, whether it's tree canopy or water or, a safe pedestrian environment, you know, what issues do we run into when delivering those? You know, when do we bump into each other? And then again, I mentioned context, which I think I spoke to last time, I'll mention it in a bit. We're kind of in the middle here as we've, we've surfaced the issues, right? And figuring out how we make, how we resolve them is that's why we have this sort of change management curve because if we can't all get everything that we want everywhere, it requires compromise. And that's the kind of hard part of the project. Um, so we're kind of in the middle of this project you know, working through a variety of these issues. I just want to acknowledge uh, what I heard from this group last time. These are some of my notes. Um, you know, I think Jen had told us, you know, that there's a limited number of tree inspectors for, you know, what up until COVID was a really high amount of development. And we obviously, uh, Portland is going to continue to grow. You know, we talked about the need that we're, we're aiming to formalize 
tree preservation through the development process. So where can the sidewalks be flexible to preserve a, um, a high value tree, a value tree? Um, and so Jim was kind of acknowledging that, you know, having criteria for these decisions that we can again, kind of act as one city um, would be helpful. Mentioned that there was misperceptions of just about how trees behave, about how deep their roots go, um, you know, and that the benefits, you know, really this idea that trees are infrastructure um, and, you know, that there are concerns about having to remove a tree later. But at the end of the day, there's this idea like, how can we, how can we think of, you know, not water versus trees versus stormwater management versus transportation, but we're all trying to, you know, these are all good things uh, that we're trying to advance. Um, you know, some of the benefits of trees in terms of their, they manage stormwater, that they address the urban heat island effect, that there are equity issues. I think Jen was just talking to some of those and there's disparities in tree canopy citywide. So I think what I heard from this group last time was a general support for, the, you know, I basically had said, are, do we have the right issues? And this group said, I think I got a, a general head nod that we were on the right course, but that what can, what can this group do to support? And so again, that's all I'm still on my mind. And when we get down there, we will, we will definitely look to you for, for that support. Um, so just a couple of the, the items, just a kind of, just a kind of reminder, I, I think I already spoke to this, you know, what we did in the early phase was exa we examined, analyzed our right away, brought a lot of data to the problem. We documented kind of the issues that, that all the bureaus encounter in carrying out their missions and, and to kind of, again, there is an infinite number of issues we really have to sort of focus on the on the uh, the most frequent and highest value issues um, and to work through. Uh, this part maybe again is a good refresher. Just when we talk about context and again trying to to really bring all of our operations into sync, uh, these maps show. This is from the uh, comprehensive plan. There's a, something called an urban design framework. The city's growth strategy. Right as we accommodate like really high high rates of growth continuing in Portland, um, we are we are growing in designated corridors and in centers. So this map on the left is showing both uh, neighborhood and civic corridors. These are all the streets where our zoning allows for higher density development. Right, so the the orange streets tend to be the smaller streets like a Division or an Alberta or Belmont. Uh, and the red streets of the civic corridors, those are the larger streets like your Sandys and 122nd, 82nd, you know, Outer Division, BH Highway, Lombard. Um, and then there's a whole series of centers and where centers are places where like sort of the, the zoning for, for higher density development is not just on the corridor itself, it's kind of in, a, in an area, right? The central city being the biggest center um, gateway and, and a number of, you know, smaller centers like Hollywood and on Sandy. And, and, and all of these, you know, this is useful context to recognize that all of our streets are not the same, right? These streets that are accompanying all this growth, we tend to have been calling them the heavy lifters. They tend to be important transit routes. You know, there's, they're important for the you know, public services to be delivered to all this higher density development. Um, so this is just an element of context that we are grounding ourselves in. And, and just to kind of illustrate that, you know, again, so some of our civic main streets are MLK, 122nd, Foster. And, you know, when we look at things like how the policy priorities start to stack up, again, the, in, in terms of a hierarchy, the, the, civic, the civic corridors and main streets tend to have the most demands on them. They tend to be really important for transit. Uh, many of them are, are freight streets. Um, so again, just to, just, you know, the, the benefit is these also are the biggest streets. So there's more opportunity for them to do more things, but even on the biggest streets, the, the demands can exceed um, the amount of space that we have. The other piece, and I believe I showed this last time is the comp plan defines pattern areas, um, recognizing that as the city has grown over time, conditions are different, right? Condition, the, the Western neighborhoods, the Southwest, or Jen was mentioning a lot of trees down is, is dramatically different in the east than the eastern neighborhoods in terms of street connectivity, in terms of tree canopy, in terms of how, how soils drain and how that relates to how stormwater is managed. Um, so taking all this information in and then this last point I just want to make on, on this one. I, I haven't shown this slide for quite a while, but I did show it to this group. This is this down along this X axis in terms of bringing data to this question. This is the width of our streets. So this is says 21, 22 feet. These are really narrow streets all the way out to like 76 foot streets that we have in East Portland. 
And these are color coded by how wide the sidewalks are. So this is existing conditions. And, and just again, like our, our rights, so we don't have unlimited space to deal with here. So these are the inner neighborhoods in the central city. So all kind of in here. Yeah, our roads are 30, often the most common road width is 36 feet. That's two travel lanes and two parking lanes or two travel lanes and two bike lanes. It's, you know, it's an Alberta street, a division street, not very wide. Um, our sidewalks tend to be, this is saying kind of they're in the 10 to 12 foot range, which is kind of within our current standards. You go to Eastern neighborhoods. So out here, right, the roads are, some of the roads are very big. Obviously that has issues for safety, it has issues for, uh, its ability to cross the street, the, you know, um, and with them, you know, related to trees, we know that these roads, this orange is saying that these sidewalks tend to be five, six, seven feet wide. These are sidewalks that really don't have a space for a furnishing zone for trees to keep other infrastructure out of the way of, you know, to really keep a nice pedestrian through zone. You have poles in the sidewalks, you know, and then we look to our Western neighborhoods out here and a lot of our streets, um, there's a lot of streets that are uncurbed. Um, there's a lot of, street 22, 24 feet wide, this is just basically two travel lanes, you know, so they're, they're really constrained by topography in a lot of cases and a lot of these streets that have no curves, they have no sidewalks. So we're dealing with a really a diversity of conditions. And, and so this is, this is again, to the need for the project to make the right place to acknowledge context and we can't make the same decisions everywhere. So just to make some of the issues uh, a little more kind of real and graphic, you know, we're trying to sort out with this project um, one, I mentioned the consistency of our transportation plans. Um, like I said, some of these streets are important for multiple modes of transportation. And so, you know, we're trying to reconcile that as a starting point for our capital projects. You know, curb zone priorities. I know we've talked about this, you know, are there more opportunities to put trees in the curb zone to utilize more of the right of way um, beyond just the sidewalk for, for tree canopy? And so again, depending on how wide the street is, we have to be strategic in these items because um, on streets that are super narrow, you know, here's an example in East Portland, it happens to be a wider street and you can see there's a stormwater feature in the curb zone. And in this case, the bike lane was able to go around it. You can imagine an instance on a narrow 36 foot neighborhood main street that's real congested and transit is stuck in traffic. And we talk about equity and you know, improving you know, sort of travel time, travel speeds and reliability for people who rely on transit. Um, we just have to be clear that we don't preclude our ability to keep transit operating on time for the people that rely on it. And then you know, within the pedestrian zone, and this is I think where we really get into some of the, uh, the issues of interest to this committee. And so we have a number of standards. We have our sidewalk standards, and this is where Michelle is updating the pedestrian design guide that sets our standards for how wide sidewalks are in different types of streets. We have access requirements, whether they're driveways and loading, and we know that those are, you know, these are places where trees cannot be. Um, we have requirements for new trees with sidewalk implementation, as well as, as uh, code to preserve existing trees. There's clearances from utilities. So there's a lot of things that are interacting in the pedestrian zone. And then when we go to implement these standards, so again, uh, we may run into existing infrastructure in the way and trees would be part of that. You know, Jen and I talk a lot, you know, it's reminded me that trees are infrastructure. Uh, and so if, if this sidewalk is to redevelop, that would impact this mature tree, right? How do we make that decision consistently so that we are um, preserving trees in the right place. And in some cases, maybe it's on, on a civic main street that's really gonna redevelop. Maybe there's sometimes when the sidewalk has to kind of, uh, you know, be reconstructed to standard and, and the trees moving into the furnishing zone. We are limited by right of way. You know, it would be great if we could just make all of our sidewalks bigger. Um, but when we don't have the right of way, that, that's that to make this, the right of way larger is that that is property that is currently belongs to private private uh, citizens. Uh, topography, even if we have right of way, doesn't mean we can actually use the space, right? In Southwest, um, topography really limits what you can do. And then there's other items, right? There's uh, active ground floor guidelines in, in areas subject to design review. There's, there's examples of buildings, you guys are aware of this, I'm sure, where the, the electrical transformer that powers the building is on the edge of the building and it just creates a whole wall of dead space. Um, and so that was part of what pushed these utility vaults into the right of way. And I think some of the consequences, I'm not sure if they were foreseen at the time, was the loss of tree planting spaces um, as, as buildings are developing. 
Uh, there's also design guidelines around matching building lines, which sometimes gets in the you know, sort of a conflict between building the sidewalk to standard versus trying to maintain the historic building line. So there's a lot of things that are going on. So what are so here's here's kind of the punchline, and then I guess we can open into discussion things that we're working on, uh, particularly related to to trees and urban forestry. We're working to formalize uh, tree preservation through the development review process and, and sort of again, so we can just make those criteria around, you know, how urban forestry thinks about and values trees so that that information is transparent to everyone. Uh, and what are the tools available to be flexible in sidewalk standards? This gets into Michelle's project with the pedestrian design guide. Uh, I have this little site design issue. Something that we heard early on in the project is that if a, if a, if a, if a site is laid out and where you put your driveways and your, 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 your utility connections to your building for water and sewer, you know, because there's space requirements from trees to driveways, from trees to utility connections, from trees to corners, if those things aren't laid out properly, the amount of tree planting spaces can, uh, can be lost. So we, we, we do encourage uh, people to co-locate their infrastructure so we can kind of get more out of the right of way, preserve tree planting spaces. But we do this, we want to make this information more, uh, more out front so that developments are coming in, you know, kind of knowing these kind of best practices so we can get more out of the out of the right of way. In terms of coordinate, coordinating with Michelle's project on the pedestrian design guide, um, we've, you know, we've done, this, our, done, our project has, you know, aimed to understand the needs of trees, how that relates to soil volume and, and things like that so that trees can thrive. So Michelle's project is looking to understand if you know, if we can make tree wells larger in certain places to increase soy volume. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it's not easy to just infinitely make the sidewalks wider, but in, in the pedestrian design guide, we are considering how that sidewalk corridor is allocated, right? There's a pedestrian through zone, there is the furnishing zone where trees and other infrastructure go. So we, we're, we're considering how wide each zone should be. Um, where we hardscape the furnishing zone, you know, our, we hardscaping tends to be required in commercial areas. Again, the city has changed since the PED design guide was last updated. We know that hardscaping a furnishing zone has negative impacts for trees. So we're, we're thinking about that. And then when I say preservation tools, this kind of relates to the, what I was talking about in the development review process. What are the tools available to, you know, when can we bend around a tree? When can we go up and over roots? Can we formalize those, those processes? Those are all things we're working on in collaboration with the pedestrian design guide. Um, you know, we realized that having a, the multi-bureau committee for streets 2035 has been really helpful for us to kind of mutually understand each of our, each of our services are complicated um, and they're all, we're all trying to achieve good things and there's been benefits to to this shared understanding. And so what we'd like to advance a recommendation that whether it's urban forestry or PBOT or B, you know, Bureau of Environmental Services, if we are making a change that is going to have an impact on space in the right of way, can we formalize how we review that with our, with our partners in the right of way? Because otherwise we just end up with more policies that are having to negotiate with each other in the real world. And um, so, you know, within that, I think, um, I think Jen was mentioning the the ten foot uh, clearance requirement that water has from its larger main lines. So water, you know, they they they're working on an administrative rule and they used our committee structure to um, to present their rule for feedback. So it was really positive, and and Jen's team provided feedback. The other bureaus provided feedback, um, including I believe on that on that ten foot rule. So that's on their radar. Um, and then the last thing we are trying to work on the idea of can we make this policy around you know electric transformer vaults in the right of way um, that, that are powering a private building can we make that a little we're working a little bit with the utility providers to just understand where you know where in the building where on private property can the, the vaults go and still meet you know there's there the utility providers are operating within national electric code you know there are rules around health and safety and and fire prevention and whatnot so we're working on a number of issues that are that are related to trees, um, and so with that, that's kind of the progress. Um, and I think this is I think this is largely similar to what I represented last time. But we've just I believe we've advanced these quite a bit, but they're still it's a big ship to move, and so we're working through it. So I think with that, um, 
you know, you can email me with any questions at streets2035 at portlandoregon.gov. This was our original schedule um, with COVID and, you know, the city's been on a hiring freeze. And so just, and just working from home, the whole thing has, I would say it slowed us down a little bit. Um, we continue to progress. Uh, I would I would just anticipate that this will probably go a little bit into, into 2022, but I do hope in 2021 that we will be able to, to bring things back to this group. So I think I'll stop there um, and open it up. Thanks, Matt. Um, did you wanna check in with Michelle if she had any, just before we open it up to commissioners sure. questions, if Michelle, since we have privilege of having you here, if you have any, any additions, any amendments to make? No, I, you know, I think Matt did a really good job trying to, um, you know, articulate all of the conflicts um, that we're trying to resolve as part of, you know, our two mutual efforts. Um, you know, I, I just want to be here today to help um, answer any questions you have since the two projects are so interrelated. Um, you know, I want to be a resource um, to committee members today for questions that you have that, you know, maybe Matt isn't digging into as deeply as we are in our project. So I'll just sit tight and hopefully have a, a good conversation with you in a moment. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Sure, sure. Thanks. All right. Can we do a round robin again? Uh, my brother's name is Robin, so I tend to think about robins, and the birds are flying outside of my window right now. So, uh, Robin seems like a good uh, approach, at least to make sure we can make get everyone. I'm going to go backwards from the direction I went last time, just to keep you on your toes. Um, how about we start, Lorena? You willing to start with any questions to Matt? We can come back to you, Matt or Michelle. Yeah, I, I have a question. I'm kind of formulating the question, but I can't uh, jump in now. Uh, yeah. because, so I think one of the biggest goals of the, uh, the uh, urban forest is to increase like canopy in East Portland neighborhoods, which has like a lower canopy rate. And, and also from the Peapod is to bring infrastructure to these neighborhoods as well. And it's, and as we saw in the presentation, it's uh, one of the challenges, the, the width of the right of the way. So I wonder if, uh, and, and also in the presentation, we saw that each case is a case. So is there any priority for, uh, for the strategies in like to both increase tree canopy and both bring infrastructure in the, in the neighborhoods in East Portland, how is the community engagement going? So I'd like to, uh, as each case is a case, if is there like any uh, any strategy or any goals for East Portland neighborhoods? Uh, Matt, do you want me to answer that? Sure. Or? sure okay. Yeah. Um, so East Portland de deficiencies in the you know I work primarily with the pedestrian network, but you know all um, transportation deficiencies. Uh, you know, East Portland really is our priority right now at Peabot just because of, you know, the equity needs and the kind of um, history we have of not investing in, in that part of town, you know, proportionately. Um, so as part of, you know, the pedestrian uh, prioritization for where and how we're prioritizing investment, East Portland is absolutely our priority. Um, and we have a whole series of maps uh, showing where our priorities are and, and you know, it very clearly shows um, that we fully intend to go to these high equity needs, um, areas with high equity needs first. Um, and I mean, that absolutely will, um, you know, help to bring trees to those neighborhoods as well. We Every time we build a sidewalk, we are always, always starting out with our standard 12 or 15 foot sidewalk that provides a furnishing zone and a place for trees. And so our priorities there um, will absolutely help you meet um, urban forestry, us, the city meet our urban forestry needs um, as well. Um, you know, where we sometimes get stuck is where we don't have enough right of way to build you know our standard full width sidewalk and that that's the sort of problem we're trying to solve right now is what do we do when we don't have enough right of way um and you know where how wide should these sidewalks be can we as matt said can we 
Are there streets where it's okay to, you know, move the curb out in some locations to provide trees and the parking zone? So we're, we're trying to solve that problem. But I think our investment priorities are very much um, overlapping with urban forestries, I think to the benefit of both of us and East Portland residents. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Jen, I, know, I see you have a hand up. Is it related? Or I can, yeah. On mute. How many times a day do, we, do I do that? Um, I just wanted to say something quick, Vivek, and that is I have really appreciated working with Michelle and Matt both because they have taken the perspective of trees as essential infrastructure and that it's we all bureaus have to own all of our missions and our goals together to move things forward. And that's real progress since when I started in my role eight and a half years ago, you know, we're still at the little kids table in, in a lot of cases, but at least for these projects, we're getting closer to sitting with the adults in terms of representing trees and tree needs. So thank you both for that and may it continue. All right. Thanks, Jen. Um, I want to go keep going uh, on the list here. Oh boy, now Zoom has juggled up all these people. Now I have to remember. Um, uh, I think it was Greg I had next. Is that right? Going backwards from Lorena to Greg? Oh, uh, sure. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One would be, I guess, for Michelle, and that's the timeline and the pedestrian design guidelines. Uh, completion, because to me, that's actually where the rubber really hits the road. That's the detail on each street. And the uh, second one would be for Matt, and that is, would it be possible, would it be possible to get a um, copy that we could actually read on that sidewalk width by pattern area? And I guess the previous map where it has the color coding. I'd really like to look at that and think about it. And I, I am wondering whether we actually have the data and it may take something interacting with the street tree inventories, but um, there are definitely some old neighborhoods in our Southeast in particular where I've lived uh, most of my time in Portland, um, where we're now not allowed to plant trees because the tree lawn is not four feet or larger. It's two and three and urban forestry has just found that even the smaller trees eventually have issues. And I guess I'm wondering, is it possible to actually have sort of the tree lawn width by area or by neighborhood or just how much of it is actually what we consider substandard because my experience um, in some of those neighborhoods and did a lot of inventories in many neighborhoods is that the lawn or space for the trees is not the same even on a whole block. So it may not be a real pattern, but just knowing how much of it is substandard, I think there needs to be something, and this would go back to Michelle, um, there's a lot of existing sidewalks that would be a lot more pleasant and still uh, passable for uh, disabled users, people with canes, strollers, whatever, if we had some standard details that actually allowed a little bit of a cutout in the sidewalks. So those, those sidewalks would have periodic narrowing sections and they'd actually be able to have trees. So basically, I really, I think I've envied that, that uh, sidewalk width chart and I'd love to see something similar for, for tree space width. I know that's like three things. No, that's fine. And I mean, I, I believe the and, and Jen, maybe you can help me out here. I've I've definitely seen maps of the planter strip area and how wide it is. That might be something that is that something that BES maintains, Jen. Do you remember? You no, know, we have that. And yeah. I saw Jeff Ramsey on on the call here. He actually is, I think, the one that created those maps for us. We certainly have them, and we'll be happy to make sure you get them. Um, and I can. Uh, just interject, I'll try and answer a couple of your questions. First about um, intermittent opportunities to widen tree wells and create pinch points and sidewalks. We are addressing that question in the PED design guide. Um, it's definitely on our radar. We've heard loud and clear that that's a design approach that uh, our reforestry in this community supports. And so we will provide some more clarity about 
um, how often pinch points in the sidewalk may occur, you know, in order to keep sidewalks passable for users with disabilities. We still want, you know, two people to be able to pass each other in wheelchairs. Um, but I think we can do that. I think we can find opportunities to, to allow for pinch points um, and the widening of, tr of tree wells on an intermittent basis. Um, regarding our timeline, uh, we are looking to complete the sidewalk corridor section by the end of this fiscal year. So that's June 30th. Um, like everybody right now, we are a little slowed down um, just due to workforce issues. So we'll see if we <laughs> meet that target or not. There are um, a couple of folks from this group who are on our um, advisory committee. So just a shout out to you to look for uh, a meeting to hit your calendar soon to review some draft material. Um, but, um, you know, we'll just say this summer, the sidewalk corridor section will look to hopefully adopt that on an inter in, in a kind of um, uh, maybe by admin rule, since we won't have the full uh, PED design guide document ready, but we want to go ahead and move forward with what we've developed because we still have to develop guidelines for corners and crossings and transit stops and, you know, everything else that's part of the pedestrian system. So um, we'll be once we get the sidewalk section done, we'll be looking for, you know, budget and opportunities to continue that work to get the whole PAD design guide package done. So we're just going to take it chapter by chapter for now. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, moving on to the next person, I think I had Anjanette next. Anjanette, any questions? No, you have your hands full, maybe still. <laughs> All right, I'm going to skip over you then. Um, uh, I think it was Damon next. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is any uh, focus being put into, since the space for trees in projects is uh, limited? in terms of, of uh, uh, sidewalk and right, and right of way. Um, is any focus being put into um, making that limited space the very best space that it could be by using soil vaults and, and other technologies that are out there uh, that have been proven across the country and across the world to uh, create better uh, growing conditions for trees, uh, better conditions that will allow trees to more fully grow to their their fullest extent and actually lengthen the time before there are uh, infrastructure conflicts and uh and then tree failure as well and i guess sorry and i guess that would be in both um in both new development and in cip projects yeah i'm not sure uh you know, who wants to take this question, you know, um, Matt, as Matt and Jen are aware, we did have our consultant uh, develop some strategies for how to strategically maximize this, as you say, Damon, the space that we do have available to us, you know, we often, you're right, we often think about um, space for trees in the horizontal plane, but there are all sorts of vertical opportunities as well um, on the other axis. And so we do have, um, you know, Matt and Jen and I and the rest of our team and Casey, we do have a meeting on the calendar, I think for next week um, to, to workshop some of the ideas that came out of that um, urban forestry consultant deliverable um, to look at some of those um, um, subgrade um, technological opportunities and also at grade um, technological opportunities to maximize soil volumes and tree health. Um, so thank you for asking that. That's a great question. All right, thanks, Damon. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Daniel. All right, thanks, Rebecca. And uh, Matt, thank you very much. I really enjoyed seeing what's going on um, since we last had you at our meeting. Um, I guess I have a couple suggestions and a question. Um, I was thinking when I when I was looking at your page of the objectives for the project, it would be great to have 
some a couple other things that would kind of raise in priority, like having something like the equity concerns be listed as one of the objectives, and also something about climate change and mitigating how how the whole streets can mitigate for climate change, um, especially since we have the city climate emergency. So I thought that might be something to think about. Um, the other thing is, I know from what Michelle said that you know there are definitely some bandwidth issues in what um, PBOT staff can do right now, but maybe this is something that the um, consultant might be able to do, and that is that you know I'm sure we're not the first city to try to um, deal with some of these issues, and I'm wondering if the consultant has had a chance to really look around at some other cities and see how they've handled some of these issues. I'm thinking in particular, the city of Eugene has, uh, I was at a, one of our World Forestry Conference meetings a few years ago, and they talked about some of the things that they're doing to get, to get around you know, limited space in the right of way. And I thought they had some pretty cool ideas. So I'm, I'm guessing that there's some other cities too that, that might. Um, and then a question I had, my question is, um, and I know this has been raised before and can be very controversial potentially, and that is, do we need sidewalks on both sides of some streets um, if there are really you know, limited space? Or even do in certain areas, do both sides of the street need to have the same standards applied to the sidewalks you know, so that we're not maybe duplicating certain services or certain things on both sides of the street if the primary goal is you know, getting people back and forth? So just wanted to, to ask that question. I'm so glad Michelle is here today because these are um, very pedestrian coordinator issues. Michelle, you want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, I'm uh, maybe not the person you want answering that question because I'm probably not going to give you the answer that you like, but um, I'm going to say, yeah, we need sidewalks on both sides of the street. We have destinations on both sides of the street. We have transit stops on both sides of the street. Um, people um, do people walk the shortest path to get to their destination. Um, and we we need sidewalks on both sides of the street to accommodate that uh, desire line. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, um, you know, when we're going in and retrofitting sidewalks where they don't exist, um, just due to lack of funds, we will often, you know, go in and try and fill in one sidewalk on one side of the street first um, so that at least at a minimum there's one protected side of the street to walk on um, but if you go out and you know do your own little William White style observational analysis you'll see that people are walking the shortest route and if that means that they're not going to cross the street so they can walk a block on the side that doesn't have a sidewalk because that's where their destination is that's what folks do so um, just to keep people safe and you know meet ADA needs we do need sidewalks on both sides um, and then Matt, I think there was a part B question there for you. Well, Michelle, just mm -hmm. uh, the other part of that question was, is it possible that in some places you wouldn't necessarily have to have the same standards on both sides of the street? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking how possibly in Portland, but definitely in other, other cities, you know, when dealing with the ADA issue, instead of thinking about bowing out the streets to accommodate more room for street trees, they bow in on the sidewalks so that most of the block you'll have passage for two wheelchairs side by side, but in certain mm -hmm. localized areas that tree well goes in and that mm -hmm. seems to have worked in, in some cities. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, um, you know, that's that you know, I mentioned this earlier. I think there are opportunities to create at, at least those pinch points um, and then Damon made, I think, an astute comment in the chat that maybe the furnishing zone isn't treated the same on both sides of the roadway either. Perhaps there's a more robust furnishing zone on the side of the street without power lines um, and, um, you know, something a little bit more minimal on the more constrained side of the street. Um, I've also seen really, you know, I came to Portland from the city of Seattle and in addition to some of those underground vaulting technologies, you know, they're doing really great things with 
um, walkable mulches on top of um, tree pits so that where you do have to cut into the sidewalk, at least the surface um, is walkable um, in that place where the sidewalk narrows, but it's still, you know, perks water and, and, and you know, creates, you know, conditions favorable for trees. So I think there are some creative solutions available to us. Thank you. Casey, did you want to respond to that? It looks like your hand's up. Yeah, you know, I should probably know the question or the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway since Matt and Michelle are here. So, you know, Michelle, you're working on what's called a pedestrian guideline. And I know that when my tree inspector staff go through public works where the frontage get desi gets designed, PBOT has very strict standards and they send applicants through these alternative design reviews in order to move from any sort of modification of the standard. And so since what you're working on is called a guideline, I'm kind of wondering how those two will or will not work together because it does become a conflict sending applicants through a process that costs them extra money to modify the sidewalk in a manner in which urban forestry is requiring to retain the tree. I totally agree with you, Casey. Um, and so, yes, these are, we call them guidelines, but they are for all intents and legal intents and purposes, they are the standards that we send to applicants. Um, so that is the document that I'm working on. And what we've been doing with Matt's um, help is going through 20 years of those alternative public works um, uh, applications and submittals to try and pull out um, ones that we can start to predict, right? Um, if there are continuous, you know, alternative public work, you know, uh, applications to build a curb tight sidewalk when we have mature trees at back of walk, for example, can we standardize that in the update to the PED design guide so that you don't have to go through that expensive process moving forward? That's one example. Um, so we're trying to pull those out of that process as much as possible with the new guide. Um, okay. And to codify those sorts of predictable constraints. Okay, that's great to hear. And you know, I wonder if it might be beneficial to have a meeting with the tree inspectors who often have to guide applicants to that process because of their requirements. Because um, PBOT doesn't always let them through. So the inspectors may have some other examples that you might not be seeing through the um, years of files that you're pulling. That's a great idea, Casey. Um, we're gonna um, start sending actual draft uh, PED design guide text to both our technical advisory committee and our community advisory committee real soon. So that's as a committee member, you know, I think a really great opportunity for you and Jen to flag issues for me that you want your tree inspectors to weigh in on and we can set up those, those sub meetings. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. And Casey, just, I mean, I think this is why when I talk about if we can sort of formalize the, um, you know, through that public works alternative process, right? Like the tree, just the, the tools for tree preservation and the, and the factors that, you know, um, that, that kind of indicate a, you know, the, the highest priority trees for preservation and whatnot. We can ideally we get to a point where we like, the, we could tell the applicant, we, we want you to preserve, you know, upfront, you know, we want you to design your site to protect these trees, you know, so rather than, you know, we're trying to like to speak collectively um, you know, as one city so that we're not having to then go into the public works alternative process because there's multiple objectives that we're trying to sort of sort out. So that's kind of like the hard work that I think we have to, that we're going to try to do and, and kind of work out those criteria. Yeah, and just to give PBOT those tools, because PBOT often really looks negatively at, oh, we got to send the applicant through this process because forestry wants to preserve this tree. And it becomes kind of a conflict. So they, they need the tools at their hands so they can say, oh, got it. I can, I can move this through without you know, having to yeah. go through what this. I hear Matt saying too, is there's an, creating an expectation that these aren't exceptions, this is the norm Yeah, for all bureaus. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut in as you were doing your uh, round thanks. robin. Either. Thanks, Casey. Um, Bruce. And go to you. Uh oh. All right. Some reason we me? can't hear you, Bruce, if you're talking. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, okay. So I live in a neighborhood that's um, had unimproved streets, and I've been here for about 45 years. It's the Cully neighborhood. 
There are many neighborhoods like this in Portland. Uh, and as currently the way you get sidewalks is if there's new development and the homeowner or the developer pays for it. It's very expensive. Um, and the only way that will get paid for is if you destroy the small houses and put in an expensive house and then it can be incorporated into those development costs for the next buyer. I think it's highly unlikely that in a lot of these neighborhoods you're ever going to get sidewalks and curbs. And I think it really raises alarms when you talk about these sidewalk design issues for neighborhoods that are not going to see sidewalks in quite a long period of time. Nevertheless, in these neighborhoods where you have maybe a paved street or maybe gravel, maybe a curb, but usually not a sidewalk, um, people are accustomed to walking on the street, not saying it's safe, cars slow down. Uh, it is true there are, are important, you want routes to school, routes to shopping districts, but um, there are, the right of way is being used there are big trees growing there and there are a lot of vehicles parked there right now. And when you want to have improvements here, there will be massive tree loss. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to have guidelines, uh, procedures in place that um, allow for changing where the center of the road may be, uh, modifying the width of the planting strip allowing for curving sidewalks or otherwise you are going to lead to massive deforestation of areas that are already low canopy. I don't have a solution, but um, when I think of these sidewalk guidelines, you're talking about narrow planting strips, too narrow for large form trees generally. Large form trees are what are going to be destroyed with increasing development. They're not being replaced we will become known as the city of small trees. So I don't have answers to these, but um, we want more attention paid to the rights of trees. Yes, we have cars. We may have less cars in the future. Uh, people get around in other ways. But um, when the spaces for big trees are gone, we don't get big trees back. It's just, it isn't going to happen unless we intentionally allow for those spaces. Streets 2035 has some tools where it can allow for spaces for large form trees. But I think unless they are really prioritized, it ain't going to happen much. Responses, our Matt, Michelle, anything? I mean, I, and that makes sense to me. I mean, I, I can, you know, picture the areas that you're that you're talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so it's like you said. I think it, in some instances, like we're we're trying to be holistic in our approach here, and to increase, you know, like uh, a case was talking about having the tools at our disposal um, for tree preservation. And yeah, I mean, there's some instances. Um, I can imagine there are some instances where it's just really, it can get really tricky. Um, if there's either no sidewalk or no trees or, um, anyway, that I, like you said, it, I, I don't think, I think that's a hard question. And so I think we wanna work to preserve as many large form trees as we can. Um, so anyway, your, your comment is, is noted and makes sense. I'm not sure that I have the, the perfect answer for it. Yeah, I'll just add on and say that I, you know, absolutely agree with you. Nobody wants to be the person that goes and cuts down large, beautiful trees. Um, and I don't know that it's, I may be saying this slightly out of ignorance because I'm much more involved in capital projects than I am in private frontage improvements, but I don't just personally know of many examples where that's happened, where we've cut down, you know, large trees um, to build a sidewalk. I'm not saying it's never happened, but I, I don't know of it. And I think part of the reason is because of what you said at the beginning of your comment is that because there are so many 
sidewalks missing in Portland. We have 350 miles of missing sidewalks just on arterials and collectors alone, not even touching, um, you know, the type of residential streets that you're, um, you know, you have in mind here, that that is our priority is building sidewalks on the busiest streets with the most vehicle uh, uh, traffic and the, um, you know, dangerous places to walk without a sidewalk. So we don't do it very often. You know, uh, 136th, I think, is a neighborhood collector, which is why we're focused on that one. Um, and maybe they cut trees. I'm not sure. You guys probably know more than I do. I don't remember. But um, I, all that's to say that uh, I, I mean, I agree with you. We need absolutely some flexibility where we have you know, specimen trees that we want to save. I, I don't think, you know, anybody wants to cut those down. And so I think flexibility and context sensitivity is critically important uh, in those parts of town. Um, absolutely agree. Um, you know, how we codify that or operationalize it, um, I think we still need to figure out. Um, you know, nobody wants to just be a mindless robot and apply standards in places where it doesn't make sense. Um, so I think I think we have some process to figure out, but I think just in terms of what you said, we we definitely agree with you. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Michelle. Um, let's round let's round the corner here. Um, coming to Barbara. Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Vivek, and um, good presentation, Matt. Um, one of the things that keeps flashing through my mind is Sandy, um, kind of over near 205 on both sides of 205. But, um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, pedestrian accidents uh, and, and uh, have been some fatalities over there as people try to cross that street because of <clears throat> the width and the speed that people um, um, are able to achieve there. And so um, one of the things that crosses my mind, and I'd like to know if you've given any thought or attention or discussion to this, is not only do I think that trees should be in, uh, you know, the uh, any kind of plans um, from an equity standpoint, um, but uh, I also, uh, you know, was thinking about the climate change. So as our climate warms, <clears throat> those trees are going to be uh, increasingly important for pedestrians on the sidewalk to keep, um, you know, to keep the temperatures just, you know, somewhat cooler and uh, for cars as well. And I mean, we all know that, you know, the parking space, uh, you know, that's shaded by trees in the parking lot in the summer is the first one to go. Um, but the other thing that crosses my mind, and, and I, I'd like to see some attention and discussion about this, is tr trees is a traffic calming device. Um, you know, when you don't have trees, I mean, it, you know, look at 205 and I-5. I mean, you know, it's so easy to increase speed, but not only do trees bring out people, they help slow down vehicles as do the, um, the blockouts that... Uh, um, you spoke of, which I think of as bump outs, but whatever. Um, anyway, have you given any uh, thought or discussion to trees, not only as um, critical infra infrastructure for stormwater, but uh, increasing uh, pedestrian use of the sidewalks? I mean, why build them if they're not used uh, that much? And um, to actually slowing down the traffic. Um, yeah, thank you for raising that point. That's absolutely one of the many, many reasons why, you know, trees are part of our standard sidewalk drawing because of the multiple benefits that they provide in traffic calming and creating a pleasant place for a person to walk and protecting somebody from vehicle traffic. And I mean, all of those are vitally important, you know, not to mention the stormwater and, and, uh, you know, heat island effect. Um, uh, so the answer is yes, uh, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the many reasons why they will, you know, uh, robust as a robust furnishing zone um, and 
everything we can do to maximize soil volumes to get bigger trees, um, as big a trees as we possibly can in the space we have will continue to be part of the standard sidewalk drawing for streets. Okay, I, I didn't hear that in the presentation. And in some cases, I think we can influence the traffic uh, to some extent by how we utilize trees um, along the route, whatever route it might be. I mean, I think we've all driven Sandy. And, you know, so I, I did not hear anything about trees being utilized as a calming uh, device or to influence uh, the traffic calming. We will make sure uh, moving forward that that important function is, you know, one of the purposes of incorporating street trees into the streetscape moving forward um, and make that point underscored. Great. Yeah, and, and I think I think Jen was just getting at this, but I'm not sure. But uh, but there is research to support that. It was done by the University of Washington and. Uh, I, I think Jen could direct you to that if, if needed. Great, thanks, Barbara. Um, we're uh, we're going to let you go here in a minute, Matt and Michelle. Thanks for taking taking all these questions and your uh, thoughtful responses and your willingness to really hear what it is that we're concerned about. Um, I, if I can just take thirty seconds to just close this out as we transition to the heritage tree point that we have is. I think what you've heard really here is that um, there is some real big concerns, not only because we've seen um, what Jen started us off with today was a discussion about how this last storm over the last week has taken out a large number of trees, unprecedented is what I heard. And that kind of really sets a tone for us in terms of how we're thinking about our urban forest and the multiple, and while you know, Mother Nature can can do these things and take out our trees. We have a lot of agency in terms of what socially constructed landscapes we generate. And that is much more in our control and our ability to design these spaces. Um, and I think what you're hearing is really the level of which the subjectivity that might be brought up or even um, language, like I was looking at some tree code language, um, specifically 11.50.060B2, um, that's bringing up the idea of, um, you know, street trees are not required where A, existing above or below gr grade utilities prevent planting street trees, or B, the design of street, uh, the design of the street will not accommodate street tree planting because the planting strip is less than three feet wide there is not a planting strip or there is insufficient place um, to add tree well. So that language, as I read it at least, is, it is wide open to get rid of trees, like insufficient for trees, like, oh, that's insufficient for trees. And it could be made on a very subjective basis. And so I think what you're hearing from us is really that level of um, subjectivity as it's on the table. And Matt, your tone was clearly one of multiple complexities and uh, constraints that you're working with. I just wanna um, kind of close this out by encouraging you to think about these comments in, in light of that level of subjectivity and all the concerns related to, of course, the safety and, and well-being uh, of, of the communities you, we all try to serve. Um, so I, I really am grateful for your open ear and um, open, willingness mind to be able to think through some of these things with us and we're we're hoping to invite you again <laughs> if you're so willing and we we'll didn't scare here. you away Absolutely. um yeah. in, to a future meeting so thanks again for taking the time and um sharing your thoughts and responses to us yeah likewise thanks to all of you for for your thoughtful comments we appreciate it thank you michelle and matt there are some comments that didn't get discussed that you should take a look at too. yeah I've, I've been watching those okay great thanks okay all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Right. Thanks. Thanks again. See ya. Thank you. All right. We have a um, heritage tree number 191. So um, this is kind of a somber note, but we have a, a proposal for delisting and removal. So um, I don't know whether Brian, is it Jen? Is it you? Is it Greg? I'm, I'm hoping that Brian could drive the PowerPoint. Okay. 
Well, and Gina Dake is here. She manages the heritage Gina. program. There's Gina. Hi, Gina. Okay. I don't hear from Brian. I don't see anything yet. So Brian said he had to step away for a minute. Okay. He'll be right back. That was two minutes ago. So hopefully he'll be back soon. Okay. Anybody know about this, at least getting started? So we- Well, Gina, do you, do you have it where you can bring it I up? I do, I have it up. I can bring it up right now. Oh, Would you like great. me to bring I'm up just, the presentation? It's not my best skill. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. Thanks, Gina. I am allowed to do that. So as, as we get going here, I wanted to preface it with just a little update on the Heritage Tree Committee because it does sort of involve how we dealt with this particular case. And I know I've mentioned it at least on one Zoom call, but basically when COVID hit, we basically stopped operating. And I thought that we would manage to look at the nominations from the previous year in June or July, but staff had had so many changes that they were re reassigned away from doing the inspections. And at that point, it's just really dawned on me that you know we are all dealing with a different reality. And I just felt that we could you know, given yeah. no action that we could take on those trees, we would just sort of wait to see when this pandemic uh, changed. And of course, in the early months, the city was basically kind of shut down, like anyone who can stay at home. So um, we still really haven't met. Gina and I have talked now, and we're going to try to get in maybe two Zoom meetings before our May 1st deadline. So I do want to, again, want to highlight that May 1 is the deadline for the next year's nominations. We are not going to go all out on pushing for more or even ourselves trying to do more because we have 29 from last year and, you know, however many that people in their, their time at home might have managed to uh, nominate. So our process on this particular tree is a little bit modified. And, and normally, according to code, what happens in these cases is the heritage tree actually meets at the tree, not something we could really do. We then bring a recommendation to you, and it's actually the Urban Forestry Commission that needs a majority vote to approve delisting. And once that's done, it can be delisted, it can be removed. Um, and it, eventually when we go to council, we'll make note of that. But you can't wait like up to a year to get to council. So this is a pin oak and it's actually nearby uh, where I used to live. And it's a gorgeous tree that I did really enjoy uh, because pin oaks change their character as they age. They lose that sort of droopy branch thing and become more uh, you know, elm-like where they're reaching up. It was designated back in 98 uh, before, as you can see, it lost the main leader here. It was 60 feet tall. It was 75 feet wide. I really don't know, and, and no one has apparently found out what caused this, but, you know, it's a circumference of 12 feet. And so to remove it, the uh, folks make a removal permit. And if Gina could advance one slide, here's the base of the tree and where it's in relationship to the house. And then another slide. Uh, this is sort of the typical summary we bring to you. So it goes through, you know, whatever inspections, uh, permit requests and all. And so, you know, starting in 98, it became a heritage tree, had a little bit of power line pruning. And I'm not gonna read all this because you guys got it in advance. But all was pretty much well until 2004 when there was one uh, scaffold branch that tore out. Then in 2011, a volunteer, you know, who was not an arborist, uh, noted the tree was basically healthy and well cared for. And this is something that we've tried to get more methodical. And I think Gina's got some great ideas on how we can use our committee and volunteers to make sure we look at each of these trees every three years. Um, but you'll see there are some gaps because we haven't really had that in the past. Um, in 2012, we had a more professional analysis and it noted uh, multiple breakouts. And in particular, this spiral growing stem that 
might exhibit weakness. And we'll see a little detail of the trunk later on. And then there's really nothing until last October. And here's where COVID again has an impact. Um, that application for removal didn't know that it was a heritage tree. When it's noted as a heritage tree, there's two people who are assigned to heritage tree inspections and they are very rapid in their response, but it did take a while. And so one thing the committee needs to know is that this particular landowner has not been pleased with how long it's taken. And I think given the season, <laughs> given the pandemic, um, I think it's very reasonable. But at any rate, um, in December, uh, Dan Gleason uh, was assigned to go and inspect it. And Gene, if you can go to the next slide. He basically got out there and said that, you know, probably half the can canopy, maybe even more, was lost. And more importantly, that um, there's no real way for that canopy to uh, recover. Um, that's the first arborist visit, and uh, or the second arborist visit. At that point, it went to uh, uh, Larry McGinnis's sort of review, and they got it before the urban forestry management team. And Larry also knew the site and knew the tree. So, you know, these folks are out and about the community. And just as I think most of us do, if you're near a heritage tree, you go and look at it, just to sort of enjoy it. Um, they uh, approved its removal, but unfortunately we didn't have a December uh, Urban Forestry Commission meeting. And then the January agenda was full. So we're here in February. To me, that's four months, not ideal, but if, Jeannie can go another slide. I'll show you some before and after pictures. So this is sort of the glory of the tree. In the growth season, you cannot really see all of this tree in one picture because the other neighboring trees encroach on it. So you've got the base at the left, that 12 foot uh, circumference, and then uh, more with the top. And then the next slide, Gina. In the winter, you can kind of back up and sort of see through the other tree branches. So um, it really uh, was a magnificent specimen, but you can see, and again, I'm not an arborist, but you can see this um, part of the defect on the trunk. And then the final picture, I believe, Gina, sort of see the before and after of the, the canopy. So, you know, pretty much the main leader is gone. Most of the remaining branches are shortened. And I really should have forwarded all this to my, the committee, but it came <laughs> the week before Christmas. And it just sort of, I was busy and I didn't even think about it. And we hadn't been meeting. I knew we weren't gonna go out and see it. Um, but I've been on these trips with my committee for probably eight or nine delistings. And I don't think people would have um, bothered. They would have seen the same pictures I saw and just said, yeah, it's, it's too bad. So I will let the committee know that they may want to go and say their goodbyes to these, this particular tree, but that's based on your action. So um, this is a public hearing. I should have said that at the beginning. I don't know if we have folks on the call. Sometimes we'll have a neighbor or a homeowner, uh, but I'd love questions from the committee. And then if Brian, can see if we've got any public comment. I'd uh, like to hear from both those groups of people and then we'll need a motion and a vote. I don't see anyone looking to provide public comment. Okay, well, I see uh, Daniel with his hand waving. Yeah, I, I gotta open this up. I'm sorry, Bruce, Bruce, what am I saying? Uh, there he is, Bruce. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, my, my question was, um, there's quite a time between the, I think it was 2012 and the 2020. I assume it's just because there really currently is no mechanism to regularly check the heritage trees, I guess, because of staff shortage or volunteers. Is that is that true? Well, we, we've actually done pretty well. I think it was more that there was just no note. The, and this is where I want to really compliment urban forestry. The elm monitor's position 
when they finish their monitoring work has done really great uh, visits the last two to three years. It's been different people some of those years, but they will go and check on heritage trees and know when they that one has been visited, but then they'll check the ones that haven't been visited. The committee itself uh, visits tree, but what Gene is trying to do is figure out a a mechanism where we can literally fill out the forms um, that we use online. They're fairly detailed. And in that way, we have a little bit more history. I am sure that this tree, because frankly, I visited it, I photographed it, um, but I did it before whatever catastrophe happened here and I wasn't making any notes saying, hey, this tree looks fine. Um, but the elm monitor's actually been doing some remeasuring which is also uh, pretty important to us on the committee. I just and if you have anything to add, go ahead. Um, let's see, I was gonna say that I think it is another thing that uh, people who make the effort or to allow a tree on their private property beca to become a heritage tree. In the ideal world, I wish we could tell them that the tree will be inspected on whatever, uh, how freak, however frequent it is. And an inspection without a written record is not an inspection. There needs to be a record of it. So it's just something to work towards as money and resources allow. Can I jump in? On yeah. that real quick. So Bruce, thank you for bringing up that point. That is an excellent point. And we are currently in the process of setting out a schedule for both private and public trees. We really want to do it um, geographically, as well as um, just what makes sense. Um, so we do have expressed interest from the Heritage Tree Committee, as well as other volunteers to take a look. Um, but they are still on private property. So property owner permissions are required before we can go there. And one thing that I did not do was to search our database of any inspections or permits that may have been applied for between 2012 and 2020. So there is a potential that there was work that was done during that time that is not noted here. Yep. Bruce, this is Jen. We, we do document inspections always. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We are at time here, so I want to make sure we're considerate of all your um, volunteering on this committee and um, all the input that you've provided so far. It's a somber note, but um, uh, Greg, any closing remarks on that? Yeah, I, I see one question saying, did this tree suffer further damage? Yeah. Uh, during the ice storm. I don't know. I would guess that some of the little end branches were encased with ice and now it's down to the larger remaining stubs. But um, it, in my mind, it was already damaged enough to not be able to recover. Um, so I concur with the urban forester's assessments. Um, I don't know if you want me to make a motion or a demon maybe as a committee member. Uh, you might want to make the motion. Uh, sure, I can. I can do that. So I, I did want to actually say, um, you know, the idea of the heritage tree uh, in Portland, I think, is a little different than heritage tree in other parts of the world. Um, in other parts of the world, this tree, in my understanding, might be something that is looked at and went, well, you know, we can still work with this to a certain extent. Uh, we can still, you know, spend the time and maybe that's because it's, or, you know, maybe that might be different when it's a public tree versus a private tree, but spend, spend the time and resources to reconstruct this canopy. Um, trees are very resilient, especially pin oaks. Um, and uh, it's possible that if left alone and given uh, enough time and resources, a canopy could be restructured, restructured out of this tree. Um, but because the Heritage Tree Committee uh, or, or, or Heritage Tree uh, definition in Portland 
is that these are exemplary trees of the species, um, then I, I say that this tree is, uh, the, the, the damage done to the tree is grounds for uh, delisting. So I'd like to make a motion to delist the tree. Okay, second. I'll actually, add, I, we, the motion should be to delist and remove the tree. Oh, okay, thanks for our clarification, Brian. Uh, motion to delist and remove the tree, sorry. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Anybody second? Okay, Barbara seconds. Um, all in favor? Virtual or, yep, all opposed? Okay, any abstentions? All right, so moved. Thanks, Greg, for that summary. And um, uh, Barbara, I want to close this out. Quick comment. You're on mute. Yeah, I have a question. I, I noted in uh, Greg in the write up that you said that six people were required to from the commission to uh, vote. Uh, in the affirmative on the delisting or any delisting for that matter. And uh, which is the majority of the 11 people on the commission. But uh, um, so I'm assuming that we got, uh, at, and then you had just said a majority. So I'm assuming we just got six, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was just curious about that. Yeah, okay. okay. So I read, yeah. I read everything you sent, Greg. Yeah, we have quorum here. I think we're good. Okay. All right. Everybody. Speaking of which, speaking of which, did you catch that Anjanette voted via the chat? Yes, I saw that. Thanks. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks again for your time here. And we will see you in a month, if not sooner. Stay safe out there. Everyone. Thanks, thank Brian. Thank you. Take good thank care. You.